The penultimate episode of Masters of the Air has just arrived, and this episode was split over several months which focused on the build-up to D-Day, D-Day itself and the months that followed. The Tuskegee Airmen were introduced to us this week and we saw what their experience was like during the war, but more specifically, the mindset that they held and view that was put upon them by others. With only one episode to go until the show concludes, I can't believe we're almost at the end. So with there being a lot to take away from this episode, let's jump into it and break down all that there was to take away from it. Here is Masters of the Air Episode 8, Ending Explained. Just to let you know, this video will contain spoilers. The Tuskegee Airmen One of the main focuses in the episode was the Tuskegee Airmen, and we actually started the episode by seeing the 15th Air Force dropping bombs in Italy on June 1st, 1944. Following its completion, we saw that they were celebrating the fact that the 99th Firing Squad had just completed 500 missions. However, amongst the celebratory feelings, Alexander Jefferson felt a sense of guilt and wanted to do more. He was keen on getting involved in heavier action because they were flying over Italy, and he wanted to be in the heart of it over Germany or France with the other men that were there. One of the main things that I took away from this episode was the fact that these men were risking their lives for a country where they were treated differently and not like a valued member of society, and we saw this actually being present on numerous occasions. For example, when Colonel Davis and the captain said that there were men that were first and second lieutenants that deserved to be captains and majors but were being looked over because of the color of their skin, and we also saw the same thing being present at Stalag Luft III. And despite the sacrifices that they'd made, the help that they'd provided to the other divisions which were up in the sky, phrases such as, they belong somewhere else and how many of them are there were being uttered by troopers, showing that their efforts were being valued less because of the color of their skin. And that mindset from back home was still there even after everything that they'd been through. Even in an environment where, like what Bucky said, was the away ground, that attitude was something that was still present. When doing some research, I found out that the real-life Alex Jefferson said that he was treated by the Germans like every other Allied officer. However, when he walked down the gangplank wearing an Army Corps officer uniform towards a white US Army sergeant on the dock, he said, Whites to the right, blacks to the left, showing that it must have most certainly felt strange and horrible. Knowing that you were fighting for your country just like every other man that was there, but being treated differently due to the color of your skin. Within the show, we spent the most time with Alexander Jefferson, Lieutenant Macon, Colonel Davis, and Second Lieutenant Robert Daniels. Alexander Jefferson was seen getting into the plane called Margot, and the P-51 that he flew in real life was actually called that. He named it after a girl that he knew back home, but following the war, himself and Margot never saw each other again or rekindled the spark that was once apparently there. Within real life, during his time in the air before being taken in as a prisoner by the Germans, he flew 18 long-range escort missions for B-17 and B-24 bombers, but he was shot down on his 19th. Lieutenant Macon was the other Tuskegee Airman that we spent a bit of time with. We saw that his plane was hit, and as he opened his parachute, he hit the ground and was surrounded by German soldiers. There was a point where it looked like he was unable to move as well. This is something that actually occurred in reality too. After landing on the ground, Macon passed out for around 45 minutes. And then, once he woke up, there were German soldiers all around him. And it was here where he'd realized that he'd broken his shoulder and his neck, which did cause him to pass out when he'd move, just like was mentioned in the show. The interrogation scene that occurred in this episode was one which also lent in on the mindset of the airmen. And the tactic that was used by the interrogator was to try and make them feel like they were underappreciated by their country and that they should turn on it, saying how Alex would be a toilet cleaner in a laboratory in the States, but in Germany, he'd be a valued scientist because of his background. But still, he didn't cave and shared no information whatsoever. This was also the case with Lieutenant Macon too. He believed that there was hope for his country back home, and with a tear going down his face, he knew and saw the fight that was going on back home for black people to not be judged by the color of their skin, something which he thought would eventually change in the future. He even said that when he gets back home, he'd help them do it a lot faster, showing the fight, determination, and passion that he had within him. The mission that we saw these lads doing was one which was a risky one. They were tasked with carrying out a mission which was the preparation before Operation Dragoon. The Tuskegee Airmen had to fly to Marseille, Saint-Tropez, and Toulon with the intention of removing the Germans' eyes, which was their radar detective systems. And all of this was going to occur with an aggressive strafing run, which essentially meant that it would be attacked repeatedly with bombs from low-flying aircraft. This was the mission where these guys were shot down and then taken to Stalag Luft III. 
We heard that this mission felt near on impossible to make it back from. The round trip to Toulon was pretty much a 1,000 mile trip, which was similar to the limit that the P-51's fuel capacity would allow them to go, maybe even under that. So the intention was never for them to come back, but to just hope to find some allied territory nearby and then make it back. It was even said that if they had to land in Germany and weren't found by the Germans, then they'd be given papers where they could try to blend in within society. Something which was just met with pure laughter at even the attempt that it could be a logical thought. The Tuskegee Airmen was a great inclusion in the show, albeit if it was brief, but I'm glad it meant that we got to spend time with Alex Jefferson and Macon. Alex Jefferson was somebody who was accepted by Buck and saw the value that he could bring. Buck didn't see people by the color of their skin. He saw them for who they were. So with Jefferson mapping routes, it seems like maybe that's going to be something that's going to be pivotal in the next episode of the show. Starlag Luft 3 A large chunk of this episode was also spent at Starlag Luft 3 with Buck and Bucky, and we saw how the sheer amount of time that they'd been there had started to get to them. Bucky was almost becoming restless and helpless and feeling like he wanted to find a way to escape. He felt like he was just being useless and sat in the camp not knowing what was going on and just waiting in anticipation and hoping that the war would be won any day soon. Again, like has been present throughout the entirety of the show, the two best friends, Buck and Bucky, had opposing views. You can almost guarantee if one thinks something, then the other will think something else. Bucky wanted to leave and find a way to escape, but Buck saw the logical side in it and knew that it was going to be a near on impossible task and would rather be sitting there waiting than being dead. Killed like many of the people that were recaptured after the events of the Great Escape. Buck was cracking on with the rest of the guys and trying to get wood so that they'd be able to make fire. Whereas Bucky was just kind of joking around with them and showing that he wasn't as hands-on in accepting what they needed to do to find a way to survive there. Something which resulted in the both of them getting into a brawl on the floor. We also saw that Bucky said that he'd been there for eight months now. So you can understand the frustration that he has, especially considering how much of a contributor he was when he was up in the air, wanting to carry out missions and be up in the sky fighting. As the episode went on, we saw that there was unrest that was present amongst the German guards that were there, and that was because they were constantly receiving news that they were on the back foot. Allied forces were getting closer to Paris, and the Germans were essentially now fighting a war on two fronts, the East and the West, showing that they were weakening. With this news spreading, the men in the camp were aware of the situation that could potentially arise, one that would be damaging to them as they could end up being killed. This is where we saw a plan being created where they'd be prepping for one of three different outcomes, execution, forced march, or a direct battle, meaning that the prisoners needed to be in the strongest condition that they could be in in order to fight back when necessary. So preserving rations, strength training, knowledge on fighting, and creation of weapons were things that then started getting done. We saw that the treatment in the camp was most likely going to be changing as well due to it no longer being run by the Luftwaffe. So it's going to be interesting in the next episode to see what the situation's going to be. Judging by the trailer, it looks like one of those three outcomes is definitely going to be occurring, but I won't spoil anything just yet. Crosby's Journey One thing that I felt this episode really shone a light on was not only the importance of Harry Crosby, but also the journey that he went on in the show. When you think back to the first episode, he was up in the air as the navigator and could barely cope flying. He was throwing up and was getting his bearings wrong at points. Whereas in this episode, we saw a completely different man. A man that was orchestrating the routes for D-Day, which consisted of 200 separate missions in total. Missions where the plans were to bomb German defenses in Normandy and hit bridges and comms lines deeper inland. We saw D-Day from his perspective. In fact, we didn't even see it because he was asleep. But we focused more on the preparations and how stressful it must have been orchestrating part of an invasion that contributed to the pivotal beginning of the end of the final year of fighting. Crosby was under pressure and didn't sleep for nearly 72 hours, and the only thing that led him to sleep was when he passed out when leaving Jack's office. He, like everybody else, wanted to continue doing their part and contributing to the success of the Allied forces. The real-life Harry Crosby himself wrote, In the week before D-Day, I worked 24 hours a day superintending the preparation of maps, flight plans, and formation for over 100 different missions. As a result, I worked for 75 hours straight. The night before D-Day, I was a zombie and was ordered to go to my quarters and get some sleep. 24 hours later, I awakened and it was all over. I'd missed it all. So although there were some slight differences in this retelling in the show, it pretty much got the gist of Crosby's experience. 
I do genuinely think that when we have moments where Crosby's narrating over the top, they do often end up being some of the better scenes. You get to capture the experience, the realness, the emotion, and the inner thoughts of somebody looking back, something which I think is used the perfect amount of times in the show. During Cross's time in this episode, we also saw the interest that he had in Sandra Westgate, somebody who we found out was actually a captain and was undercover whilst working in Paris. With the completion of D-Day, Cross was given a month's leave to return back to the States so that he could refocus, and it was before this time that he managed to get a hold of Sandra and arranged to meet with her before he left. However, when he got to the hotel, there was a note which said that she was sorry and that she got called away again, but she'd always remember their time together fondly. This kind of felt like the perfect way to round off their story, because within Crosby's memoir, it comes across like Harry wasn't actually 100% aware of what it was that she did, and that he just had a strong connection with her and was somebody that he remembered fondly, so it was almost like a nice homage to that. Amongst the D-Day preparations, we also saw a change in Rosenthal. He was now up front giving the team talks and preparing them for the missions that they were going to be going on. Only two episodes ago, we saw that he completed three missions, but following him completing the 25, we saw that he was promoted to CO. So it looks like that role has been taken on in his stride. Overall review I thought this was a good episode of the show. It wasn't my favorite, but it's definitely up there. I've loved watching Masters of the Air, but I think if I were to criticize one thing about it, it's the fact that so much time passes in each episode. Does anyone else think that? For example, we had D-Day and then it just transitioned to two months later. I know there's a lot to get through, but I'd almost rather just do that at the end of every episode. Within Band of Brothers, the story flowed so well because each episode was essentially set in one specific time period, other than the first episode, which showed us the course of two years. So I think the constant changing of time is one thing that can disrupt the flow of the episodes in the show. I'm still really enjoying it though, it's just a small critique and preference that I've got. I actually can't believe we're almost at the end of the show. I feel like I've gone on a real journey with the characters and it's going to be hard to say goodbye to them because we've watched them go through so much. Even hearing Crosby's inner thoughts is something that I think allowed us to form a deeper connection. The Tuskegee Airmen were a great inclusion in this week's episode too, and from what I've read and heard about, they deserve to be recognized in this show. One thing I am a bit gutted about is that we didn't get to see the action on D-Day, as I feel that could have almost been an episode in itself, but I'm guessing maybe budget would have prevented that, as apparently the show cost a quarter of a billion at where it's at now, and I bet a D-Day specific episode would have added to that dramatically. But I do suppose the story of Masters of the Air is based on Miller's book and also Crosby's memoir, so it kind of makes sense why we saw it from Cross's perspective. The performances in this episode were also top tier. There's not been a bad performance in the entirety of the show, and I think that shows the quality of performers that they've got. I'm expecting some of the actors that I've not seen before to go on to big things. You look at the cast of Band of Brothers and all of the cast pretty much went on to have success in some capacity. And I hope the same for these guys as well as they've been great in every episode and brought us along every step of the way. I just want to say as well, the trailer for the finale at the end of the episode. My God, it looks like it's going to be an emotionally epic one which is going to give this show the send off that it deserves. I hope it's going to be a longer episode, post an hour maybe, considering that it still feels like there's a lot that the show needs to wrap up. I'll be releasing a breakdown on the trailer tomorrow, so be sure to keep your eyes open for it. So, there you have it. Masters of the Air Episode 8 Ending Explained If you want to see breakdowns on every episode of Masters of the Air, then click on the card in the top corner. I've got a playlist containing them all, so you can start from wherever you want and just work your way through it. Also, if you'd like to see breakdowns on Band of Brothers, then I've been covering that show as well. I've got a breakdown of episode 1 and 2 over on the channel at the moment, and I'll be releasing episode 3 this weekend. Thanks for tuning into the video, and I'll see you in the next one.